Good morning. My name is Lisa Trevilian. Please stand and join me for our call to worship from Psalm 103 up on the screen. Your part is in bold. Bless the Lord, O my soul, with all that is within me. I will bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You forgive our iniquity and heal our diseases. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So great is your love toward all those who fear you. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let us worship God. Voices together as we sing, I want to walk as a child of the light. Please stand. God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We greet you with praise on our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts. You take pity upon us and shower us with your blessings, satisfying our every need and renewing our strength. You lift us above all earthly cares and grant us a vision of your eternal salvation. We bow in reverence before you and rise to praise you. You are the God of new life. Breathe new life into us this morning as we worship you. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning, everyone. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Doug Burian, the Director of Music Ministries here at Glenel United Methodist Church. It's great to see you all here in person. And I know those of you at home are uh, snuggled up nice and warm and enjoying worship as well. It's great to see you. Uh, we certainly welcome everyone here today, those who are in the building and those at home. A few announcements for us this morning. Uh, first of all, next Sunday is All Saints Sunday. And so if you have a name that you would like to share to have as part of that service, we need those names by today. And what we ask for is the date of birth, the date that your loved one passed away, and then if you have a picture you'd like to share, that's what we are looking for, and you would send that in to Gail in the church office, and we will make sure to include it in our service next Sunday. And under the category of outreach, we are still looking for somebody who has a van or another large closed vehicle or trailer that you could lend uh, for a fill the vehicle donation event taking place on November 15th and November 22nd maybe both of those dates, one of those dates. Uh, if you do have a vehicle that fits that description, I ask that you please contact the church office or Jackie Banner directly to let her know that you can help out in that way. As a reminder, we are indoors for worship this point moving forward. Uh, we're so grateful for the ability to worship outside. The season has changed and uh, we will now worship inside as we have been. And so we still have room for those of you at home if you would like to give it a try, uh, it is a wonderfully safe environment and you will be well taken care of should you choose to give it a try. We also do have Air Hall available. Uh, Air Hall is broadcasting the live stream as well. And so if some of you would like to be in the building but maybe not so comfortable with being shoulder to shoulder, that's an option for you as well. Uh, and you will be well taken care of in there. Just a simple reminder, I think we're all getting used to this now. Uh, if you are expressing any signs or showing any signs that we now know to be related to COVID, we ask that you do stay home uh, and, and worship from your home. And I would also ask that if you have come to know that, uh, you know, during after a time in our building, you either started showing symptoms yourself or had close contact with someone that did, that you please let the church office know so that we can uh, appropriately contact Trace uh, anyone that might be affected. I would also like to, you, got, you heard them already, but we have wonderful musicians with us this morning and I'd like to welcome them by name. We have Sarah and Sean Kim joining us this morning. So grateful to have you, so grateful to have the life of your music uh, in our space this morning and to be able to share it with all who choose to log on. We're so thankful to have you here. As we shift to a time of offering, I ask that we center our hearts and our minds and we think about what that offering means for us. For some, it's a financial giving, uh, which allows us to do so many things, so much outreach, so much help in our community, keep the building running, enable this worship service to happen. So the financial gifts are certainly important and we have a number of ways where you can do that. We have offering box here in the sanctuary and then we have online options as well. So we thank you for prayerfully considering those financial gifts. As we've been talking about, the financial gifts is part of the story. It's not the whole story. And so we ask you during this time of offering that you consider how you might offer more of yourself uh, to God, to the life of this church. We all come with different gifts, with many gifts, and now is our time to prayerfully consider how we might share those with one another.
O oh God of new life, you restore us with the hope of the gospel. You bind up our wounds and make us whole once again. You enliven us with the gift of your spirit and empower us to serve you in thought, word, and deed. Accept now the gifts we bring, transform their worth, and enhance their effectiveness to accord with your will. If you know our Lord's Prayer, please pray it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. My name is David Dean, so I'm blessed to be the pastor here at Glenelg Church, and I am glad to be here on this rainy day with you to worship the Lord. Uh, it's always a good day uh, to worship and to be with our church family and with those online, so I'm glad to be here. Um, you know, I about fell out uh, this weekend. I woke up on Saturday morning. Uh, it was my daughter's birthday, and I realized I have a 20-year-old now, and I am too young to have a 20-year-old daughter. So it's been a long and hard weekend for me. So I'm here by the grace of God this morning, but happy birthday, Natalie. 
So today's sermon, as usual, is an interactive sermon, uh, so I encourage you with the family and friends that you've come with to, to be ready to interact a little bit and, and with me, and if you're at home, to be willing to uh, interact uh, at home with uh, folks you're at home with. Uh, or like last week, uh, my kids were able to be at home watching online, and my wife was here, so she grabbed her cell phone and, and started a text group with the family, and they were back and forth kind of interacting that way. So there's different ways that you can interact um, to better engage with the scripture uh, this morning. So can anyone remember what the scripture passage was from last week? What was last week? Isaiah 53. And can someone else, do we remember just a briefly, what was Isaiah 53 about? What was Isaiah 53 about? The The future suffering of Jesus, yes. The suffering servant. So it talked about, very different than the Leviticus passage where we talked about this, this uh, uh, animal offering. All of a sudden there was the suffering servant, the servant of God who came, uh, was going to offer himself uh, and his suffering was because of us and our sin and our issues. So very different, good. But it pointed to, it's laying the, found, the foundation and the groundwork pointing more and more to the coming of Jesus, God's Messiah, God's servant uh, Jesus, who who was God in the flesh, is God in the flesh. And so the Bible also tells us that as as we're engaging in the word, right, that we're called to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. And so I, I encourage you every week as part of that is to, is God speaking to you in some way in that passage? And so I encourage you every week to to think about how God is encouraging you to apply that passage and to take that step of faith uh, and to even share with someone if God leads you to do that. So I just want you with the person, maybe somebody that you're next to or if you're online, just let each other know um, if you were able to, if you were able to do that. Did you, did you do what you're able to, what you said you would do, what God told you to do and were you able to share with with someone this week. So you can just let the people that you're with know real quick. And if you're online, feel free to post that online. Kind of, yes, you're able to do that. Um, and, and yes, you're able to share with someone. All right, the new passage this morning that we're going to jump into, the, the idea is, the, the big idea is that today we're going to talk about how despite our constant unfaithfulness, right? People, if you, if you haven't noticed uh, yet, uh, and if you haven't looked closely at your own life, right, we're, we're, we're constantly unfaithful, right? Even though we might have the best of intentions, we easily slip back into unfaithfulness one way or the other. And so despite our constant unfaithfulness, God continues to be faithful. His love remains constant, and he's willing to take us back. That's the idea, the big idea for today's message. Now, before I go further, I just want to give kind of a warning. If you were parents with kids, you probably got our email. But for those of you that are online, maybe didn't get my email, or those of you here, today's scripture passage, if you read ahead, Hosea 3, does kind of talk a little bit more about some adult topics, some adult concepts and ideas. And so our sermon discussion today is going to be a little bit more PG rather than G. So I just wanted to give you a heads up uh, for those of you that might be here with kids or those that are online with kids but it will be PG so it'll it'll be still sensitive and still very respectful for sure well you know one of the hardest things that I have to deal with as a pastor uh, is is when someone comes into my office needs to talk to me and they're heavy-hearted and they share about adultery in their marriage the pain and the heartache of that certainly cuts deep because it's so personal, isn't it? Turning your back on your spouse through adultery is, is a rejection of their love, their commitment, and, and a rejection of your whole life together. But betrayal of any kind is always a serious thing, isn't it? Think about the different maybe betrayals in, in your life. We've all had some kind of betrayal because people are unfaithful. And so not just betrayals between husbands and wives, but but between parents and children. Maybe you have that going on in your family. Between friends, between coworkers or business partners. We highly value personal and relational loyalty. 
And when someone breaks our trust in this area, it's very difficult to forgive them, isn't it? In the Bible passage we're about to read today, God talks about our betrayal in terms of adultery and and even prostitution. So, So hang on to your hats as we jump in to read the scripture from Hosea 3. I'm going to invite Lisa up to read from both the New Living Translation and the Message Translation. Listen carefully of, of what God is telling us in these scripture passages. Hosea 3, New Living Translation. Then the Lord said to me, Go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver and five bushels of barley and a measure of wine. Then I said to her, you will live in my house for many days and stop your prostitution. During this time, you will not have sexual relations with anyone, not even me. This shows that Israel will go a long time without a king or prince and without sacrifices, sacred pillars, priests, or even idols. But afterwards, the people will return and devote themselves to the Lord their God and to David's descendant, their king. In the last days, they will tremble in awe of the Lord and his goodness. Hosea 3, the message. Then God ordered me, start all over. Love your wife again, your wife who's in bed with her latest boyfriend, your cheating wife. Love her the way I, God, love the Israelite people, even as they flirt and party with every God that takes their fancy. I did it. I paid good money to get her back. It cost me the price of a slave. Then I told her, from now on, you're living with me. No more whoring, no more sleeping around. You're living with me, and I'm living with you. The people of Israel are going to live a long time, stripped of security and protection, without religion and comfort, godless and prayerless. But in time, they'll come back, these Israelites, come back looking for their God and their David King. They'll come back chastened to reverence before God and his good gifts, ready for the end of the story of his love. Amen, thank you, Lisa. Well, the question I have for you first is, what does this passage teach us about people? As you listened to that, what does it teach us about people? I wanna take one minute uh, and with the people that you're with or the people you're with uh, online at home or online uh, on church online, uh, let's take one minute to ask that question, search the scriptures together and then share with one another a bit. Take one minute. Okay, how about sharing maybe a few thoughts? What does it teach us about people as we 
think about, read this scripture. Anybody? Uh, keep your mask on, but you can call it out or raise your hand. I'll call on you however you want to do it. And online, please share. Feel free to share online uh, in, the, in the chat. What does it teach us about people? Right here. They're going to disappoint us, right? They're unfaithful, right? What else? Over here. There's always forgiveness for us. That's good. Okay, good. What else? Anything else? Right here. Okay, good. Uh, not, never satisfied. Always looking for more. Always looking for more. Wendy, something online? People can be thoughtless. People can be thoughtless. Okay, good, good. Good. They, he was using the story of, of people and, and our lives, how we are, as a, as a metaphor. Good, good. These are good. So, very similar to kind of what I was looking at as well. And, and number one up there is that we're unfaithful, right? As it's obvious in this passage, God was getting across uh, to the, the point that we as people uh, are unfaithful. When we make other things the gods of our life instead of the Lord, it's relational unfaithfulness. It's, it's betrayal, basically. It's like adultery, the, the passage is teaching us. It's, uh, it's as harmful and toxic to our relationship with the Lord as adultery is to a marriage. So the Lord's using, using that illustration. Uh, and, and, and he says that we've, we've turned our backs on God, rejecting the very one who loves us immeasurably and is committed to us eternally. So that's important. You know, we, you know in, in, in adultery, you reject the, the love of someone who you're committed to, is committed to you. Uh, not always the case, but in general, you know, you're, you're breaking that commitment, you're breaking that covenant. And so God's saying, we're turning our backs on him who, who loves us more than we could ever imagine, more than any spouse, more than any friend, more than any parent. God loves us immeasurably. And he's committed to us eternally. And, and when we're unfaithful to him, by going after other things in this world than him, when we put other things first in this life, it's like adultery. But he also says, it's also like prostitution. Again, another, another graphic uh, word here for us. And he says it's like that because we trade our love for whatever pleasure, desire, achievement, or material possession that comes our way. It's a cheap exchange. We exchange something very valuable and special for momentary comfort, for contentment, momentary gratification. And it doesn't last, does it? Those things can never provide the love and the satisfaction and the eternal security that a relationship with God provides. Another point is that, like Hosea's wife, we need times of abstinence and self-denial to keep our focus on God and not on other things. You know, we live in a world today that says that we don't need to practice restraint, that we don't need to deny ourselves of any pleasure. Why, why would you do that? If you want it, why shouldn't you be able to have it and have it now? Whether it's sex or material things or, or chemically induced feelings, today's culture says indulge. But just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. You know, practicing restraint and learning to be self-disciplined is actually a good thing. It's a, it's a healthy thing for us to do. It's also something that will help us stay connected to God. You know, there are going to be times in our life, seasons in our lives, where we need to just stop, remove the distractions, remove the temptations of life, especially when we begin to notice that those things are pulling us away from God and healthy relationships. Right? But usually we just keep on going. We, you might start getting that feeling that, hey, I'm not on a good path here. Hey, these things are beginning to take over my life. I'm losing control here. I'm 
getting disconnected from God. I'm getting disconnected from my spouse. I'm getting disconnected from my parents. I'm getting disconnected from my friends. These things aren't maybe good, and, and we start to notice it. God gives us little clues, but we get so busy and we get so focused on those things because, hey, we want those things, the momentary pleasures or achievements or success that those give us, and we keep on going. But yet this passage is reminding us, suggesting to us, maybe even telling us that, hey, there are times in our lives where we just need to stop, remove ourselves from those distractions those temptations in our lives, take a step back so that we can better stay connected to God and the healthy relationships around us. Now, when we do that voluntarily, it's called a spiritual retreat or fasting. But when we wait too long, when we wait too long and we hit rock bottom, it's called rehab. It's called prison. It could also be divorce or loss of a job. The point is, if we don't voluntarily stop and sober up, whatever that sober up means for you in your life, then God may allow a sobering up time to happen in our life nonetheless. But even this can be an act of love. I know men that have come to Jesus in prison. I know men who, if they hadn't been forced to to go to rehab, wouldn't be alive right now, wouldn't have their marriage intact right now. I've got another friend who only faced his real issues because his wife finally left him. Now, I wouldn't, and I'm not, wishing these things on anybody These are horrible things that happen because we continue down a destructive path and we don't stop and remove ourselves from those things that we see ourselves being tempted to, that we see being a distraction to healthy relationships and most importantly to a relationship with God. And I wouldn't wish those things on anybody. But God can and does use those things for good. Not that God wants those things, not that God is causing those things, but God's going to allow us, if we don't listen to him, if he's saying, here, take a different path, stop going down that way, come back to me. If we don't listen to him, sometimes he allows those things to happen so we get to a time where we sober up, whatever that looks like for us. Because sometimes, folks, you know that just like I know, if we don't hit rock bottom sometimes, we don't stop. Maybe you have a family member like that or a friend like that. Maybe, maybe in some ways you're like that. You know, unless the pain gets to a level, you know, pain can actually be more of a motivator than pleasure. Did you know that? Until pain gets to a certain level where we say, I just can't take it anymore, ultimately we don't stop. Maybe you've noticed that in your life as well. But God can use those things. God can let us get, God can use that pain in your life. God doesn't want to hurt us. God doesn't want to suffer us to suffer But God can use that pain in your life. God can use that hard thing in your life to, to, to slow you down, to stop you, to remove you from the distractions and the temptations and the things that you're doing in life and let you sober up, give you a different perspective. This time of separation and restraint, whether it's self imposed or not, is often the very thing we need to find healing and the love of God, and devote ourselves again to him. Another question for you this morning is, what does this passage teach us about God? What does this passage teach us about God? Let's take one minute again with those that you came with, those that you're at home with, or those uh, folks online in the chat. What does this passage teach us about God? We have one minute.
All right, what did, what did you think? What did God show you as you thought about that scripture or read through it again? What does this passage teach us about God? Anybody want to share? Up front here. Up, oh, go ahead, go ahead. God is always with us in our darkest moments. God is always with us in our darkest moments. Good, right up here. God forgives us, good, good. Anybody else you want to share? Wendy, how about online? Anybody online have something? God is incredibly forgiving. Good, very good. Uh, as we listen to what this passage teaches us about God, you know, I, I saw too that God loves and cares for us deeply. I hope that comes across. God loves and cares for you and for me deeply. Just look at the lengths that he went to in this story to help people understand that, right? I mean, look at the lengths that he went to. Poor Hosea. I always read this and I'm like, whew, poor Hosea. And God using him there as his prop kind of, right, for this, for this story and this illustration. I, you never want to be a prophet. I don't think a prophet wants to be a prophet, but you're called to be a prophet and you, sometimes you have to face some hard things. But God, by using the emotionally and the graphically charged imagery of adultery and prostitution, God wants us to see and understand and even feel, right, the grief and the harm that we are causing by our unfaithfulness to him. That's why he's using this graphic imagery. That's why he's going to the lengths that he is because he knows that we, we understand it, we felt it, we've experienced those things in our lives and, and we know the harm and the hurt that they cause. And the way God makes his point, right, it's, it feels more like the, the dramatic stunt of a jealous and a grieved spouse than it does the God of the universe, doesn't it? When you think about, you know, sometimes we've got this very proper idea of how God should act and we put him in this little box and yet God then kind of, some of you probably have never heard this scripture before and you certainly have never heard it preached from, from the pulpit. And yet here it's in scripture, here it's in the Bible, kind of helping us to see God in a different way that he's going to use something like adultery and prostitution to get a point over to us. The Bible is not boring. For those who say the Bible is boring, the Bible is not boring. There's some stories in here that will raise the brow of any proper person. But God is bigger than the box we put him in. And he uses this graphic imagery to help get this point across to us. Because it affects our minds. It, it, right? You feel it in your heart right now. You feel the awkwardness of it. You feel the, 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 the anxiety of this. And especially if you've been through something like this before, you feel the pain of it. And God says, yes. That's what it's like. That's what it's like when you're unfaithful to me. I want you to know the harm in that. I want you to know the messiness in that. I want you to know how it's affecting more than just you. It affects, it affects the people around you. It affects your children. It affects your friends. It affects your church family. And I wonder, does a story like this, does it suggest that, that God feels jealousy, heartache, and grief like we do because he loves us so deeply? Perhaps. I don't think God has the insecurity piece, but God is a jealous God. God loves deeply. God grieves over us because of our unfaithfulness. Another thing that this passage teaches us about God is that despite our unfaithfulness, right, this was a big point, some of you have said this, despite our unfaithfulness, the good news is that God is still faithful to us. You can't always say that about a spouse, even a parent or a good friend, but you can say that about God. Despite our unfaithfulness, Despite our adultery and prostitution and, and our wayward ways, God is faithful to us. God is faithful to you. He loves you. He loves me despite our wayward ways. And that's the, main, that's the main message of this passage. And really, it's the main message in the Bible. If you don't get that, God's grace and God's love, then you've missed the main message here. Unlike us, God's love and faithfulness never waver. We, we waver, we're fickle, but God is not. 
God's love and faithfulness are unconditional and is not dependent on us. Right? Don't you know the love of other people who their love for us or maybe even their like, their friendship with us depends on us. You know, how much we love them back or how much, you know, how we act that day or uh, whether we give them what they want. But God's not like that. His love is unconditional. It is not dependent on us and our behavior. No matter what, God always remains faithful, loyal, and steadfast. Another point. God wants us back. Did you hear that? God wants us back. And so he pays the price to get us back. Just as Hosea did for his wayward wife. God pays to get us back. Even though we don't deserve it. Even though you might say, well, good riddance. God says, no, I, I'm going to go and I'm going to bring them back. Just as he had Hosea bring his cheating wife back, God wants to bring us back. It sounds a lot like uh, Isaiah 53, right? That God wants us back. He's willing to pay that price for us, the, the, the hard price for us. And even though, we incur, even though it was us who incurred the cost, even though it's us who made the mess, God bails us out big time. Because he loves us. You know, Jesus' death on the cross is God's big bailout for the human race. No government can bail us out like that. This is bigger than any government bailout or anything that anybody else or any other organization or piece of humanity can do. God bails us out in Jesus Christ and he welcomes us back. He says, come back with me. Another point, God wants to separate us out from our sinful lifestyles. Did you see that? As he had Hosea uh, calling his wife back, God calls us back and he says, I, I want you back and I I'll take you back just as you are. But here, let me invite you to something new. Let me invite you to, to live this relationship with me in a way where you'll really experience the joy, the love, and the peace with me that you really want. Those things that you're seeking, those things that you're going out to those other gods, to those other priorities in your life that you, you think you want, you think those things are going to give you, let me show you a way to live with me where those, the deepest needs of your heart, you will receive. But he says, let me tell you, the, the way to do that, though, is you've got you've to live this certain way. You've got to stop these other things. They're only leading you to a path of destruction and hurt and not what you really want. And so once God has, has bailed us out, he tells us, he tells us to stop our prostitution. He says that is to, to stop our sin. Stop going after the things of the world. Those things are not going to meet our needs. God calls us to be holy and to live holy lives. And to be holy means to be separated out, to be different. God wants to separate us out from the unholy ways of this world. He calls us to live differently and to speak differently, to love differently than those who don't know him. Now the Bible's full of ways which God calls us to live holy lives, right? There's all kinds of ways where God says, here, let me give you, let me give you the the guardrails to keep you in line where, where you can live a, a life of satisfaction and peace and wholeness. You know, because if you go off this way, you go off this way, you're going down the mountain. So let me, let me give you some guardrails that'll help you. That's what God does throughout Scripture is give us, invites us into a way to live that keeps us whole, that keeps us safe, that keeps us uh, connected to Him and connected in healthy relationships. And the best example of that, of course, is, is Jesus who, who models for us what it looks like to live a life, that life of peace and wholeness and, and, and shalom with God. While God loves us no matter what, he does love us too much to just leave us in that sin and to say, well, okay, no guardrails for you, good luck. God loves us too much for that. And so he does, he calls us out of our sin for our own good. He invites us to see a different way to live. All right, to wrap all of this up, by using the imagery of, of adultery and prostitution, God wants us to know the harm 
and the pain of our unfaithfulness to him, right? And just like adultery and prostitution, our sins not only harm us, they affect the whole family. They affect the people around us. And most importantly, it harms our relationship with God. He's heartbroken over our betrayal. Hear that. God is heartbroken over our betrayal, and he grieves over the destructive path that he knows those decisions that we're making will take us as we get farther and farther and farther away from him. But the unbelievable, unbelievable, incredible message of Hosea is that despite our unfaithfulness, despite our cheating in wayward ways, God knows uh, uh, that he still loves us. God does still love us. And he wants us back. God wants you back. He wants me back. He's paid the ransom. He's paid the bail. And now he invites us, come home. Come home with me, he says. God will take us just as we are. We don't have to clean ourselves up first. God loves us. Remember, it's unconditional. We don't have to get all cleaned up to go to God and for God to love us or for God to take us home. He takes us just as we are. But then he wants us to trust him enough to invite us into a new way to live and to be. Now, it might take us a while to, get, uh, to adjust to that, but once we do, we will know the love and the devotion of God and we'll love him back wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. And I love that last verse in the New Living Translation, and we'll tremble in awe of the Lord and his goodness. Not so much, there's been other times we've talked about the awe and the sense of fear, But this is all in the sense of goodness. Wow. You know, I I did a wedding the other day, and we were driving home, and we, we opened up the thank you card that they had given us. And it was such a gift. You know, I didn't charge them. There was nothing. They were part of uh, the other church I was have been part of, and this was the last wedding, and so we kind of finished that up and made the transition. So there wasn't any, any charge, and they just gave this, this gift, this love gift to us. And it was such a gift. We, my wife and I about crashed the car. <laughs> but we, all, it was, I, we stood in awe we, in the car there. I guess we weren't standing. We were sitting. Um, but we, we sat in awe of the goodness of that gift. I want you to know that all of the goodness of God. And he invites you back in through his faithfulness and his love for you. And so I wonder if this message of Hosea is speaking to you today. God has paid your bail through Jesus and is inviting you to start a new life with him today. Will you take him up on that offer right now? All you have to do is be willing to turn from your old ways and to say yes to God, to say yes to following Jesus. If you're saying yes to Jesus today, would you raise your hand or would you put online, would you put yes? If you're saying yes to Jesus today, let us know. Take that step of commitment. Surrender your life to him online or here in this room. Good, I see hands. I know I'm sure online God is speaking to you this morning. Or maybe, maybe you've said yes to Jesus before, but today you've realized that you, you're still devoted more to your other loves than to God. Maybe the Scripture has challenged you today, and, and God, the Holy Spirit, is whispering in your ear, that's you. I know you've said yes to me. I know you, I know you come to church even. I, I know maybe even you read, read your Bible from time to time. But, but you're putting those other loves before me. You're putting success or money or activities or golf or whatever it might be. You're putting those other things before me today. And it's grieving me. It's hurting me, God says. And so today maybe God has spoken that to you. And if that's you... 
Ask God to help you today to remove yourself. Remove yourself from those things this week so that you can learn to more fully devote yourself to God, that you can love God more and know his love more this week. If that's you, if God's been speaking to you today about that, well, you, you've said yes to Jesus, but there's other loves in your life and God has told you, you know, you're putting some other things before me, you can raise your hand today or online you can put yes, that, yes, that's me. I've, I've been putting other priorities, God, before you. I, I know I have. I know I get caught up in that and I, you know, I, I love God, but I find myself slipping. It's so easy to do, to slip into putting those other things in place before my love for God. You know, I, I gotta get things done. I gotta get up and get to work. I gotta, you know, I gotta take care of the things I gotta take care of in the morning. And I, maybe I miss my, my devotion time or I don't spend as much time uh, that morning. And I find myself more worried about these other things and anxious about those other things than my, than my focus on God. So if that's you this morning, you can raise your hand or put yes in the, uh, in the, in the chat because that's, Maybe that's what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. So during our last song, I want you to continue to, to pray about thing, these things and ask the Lord. If, if maybe one of these things wasn't what God was speaking to you, ask him, what should, what should I do this week, God, in response to the passage? Lord, what are you speaking to me? What's my next step of faith this week? And, and God, maybe even who should I share with this week? Maybe this is a passage or something that was said is something that you need to share with, with a friend or a, a child or a, a spouse. And so let's, as we prepare to sing this last song, uh, I just want you to be praying those things and ask God to speak to you. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. What should you do this week in response? And maybe who should you share with this week? We're going to go through the verse one time instrumentally, and so just listen to that, and then as we begin to sing, I invite you at that point to stand. It's God of grace and God of glory. stand. Breathe. 
You know, pastor's kids have a hard time because their dad's up there or their mom sometimes, and they're going to always talk about their kids. You know, I've always already mentioned Natalie, so now I've got to mention Evan. The other day, we were doing this passage in our family discovery group, and so we went through this as a, as a family, and at the end, we asked, you know, as well, you know, how is, what is God telling you about this passage? And so when it got to Evan, he'd been thinking and praying, and he said, you know, I, I don't know exactly, but I do know this. He said, I see that Hosea had to sacrifice and that that kind of represents, you know, God's sacrifice for us. He said, so for me, God put it on my heart that, that I'm, I should look to, that maybe this week I'm going to sacrifice for somebody, that, that I have to give something up and help somebody in a way that, that is, a, is sacrificial. And we said, okay, Evan, that, you know, and he said, and, and maybe that person I'll share with as well when, when the time comes. So we ended and, and he went on his way and Two or three days later, he was at work, and he gets off about 9, 9.30, and so he texts, and he said, Dad, I'm, I'm running late. And I'm, you know, of course, I'm the dad. What do you mean you're running late? You know, it's already 9.30. You got to get home. I don't want you out with friends. What are you doing? It's late. It's school night or whatever it was. And he, said, he just texts back. He said, Dad, it's my I will. <laughs> he said, Dad, it's my I will. And so I, I trusted him enough at that point to say, okay, son, I'm praying for you. Be careful. It is 930 at night. I don't know exactly. He said, I'll fill you in later. So I, we trusted him, and he, he went off, and he came back maybe an hour later, um, and, and, we, and he got home. We said, what happened? Are you okay? And he said, there was a guy I work with. He said, it's a long story, and I'm not going to tell you all the story, but uh, it's a long story. And he said, um, he said he was in some trouble, and he needed a ride home. Uh, and, and so he said, Dad, it was more than just he needed a ride home, right? So he, he needed a friend. He needed something. He needed God. So Evan said, I just felt like God saying, that's your moment. Give him a ride home. And he said, and he said I wanted to pray in the car. He said, I was just waiting for an opportunity that felt, you know, right. He said, now, Dad, I, I didn't get a chance to pray with him in the car, but he took him, ended up having to take him to a hotel. And he said, when we got to the hotel, he said, I, I just told him that, you know, all that he's going through, God loves him. And, that he, he, said, and he said, Dad, I, I just told him I'd be praying for him. And so that was his I will. And I was so proud of my son for doing that. Now, Natalie has those type of things too, and I'll have to, you know, brag on Natalie another day. But I just share that with you all to just, to just say, you know, it, it just takes a step of God speaking to you. And my son came back so excited of how God was using him in that moment. That's why I ask these things. I know some of you are like, why does he ask? You know, this is, you know, intimidating or, you know, this is weird. We don't do this normally. But I, I invite you to do these things because I want you to know the, the power of God and the grace of God working through you and in your life to bless you, to bless your family, to bless others around you. And it takes the step of faith. It takes even the tiniest step of faith. Taking, taking out of Evan, taking his time, extra time to go out of his way, another hour late at night to take somebody home, you know, it wasn't a huge thing, but it was a sacrifice. And so what's the one thing God's calling you to do this week in response to this message? And, and maybe there's somebody in that car that you want to pray with or tell them at the very least, you know, Jesus loves you. I know what you're going through. He loves you. He wants you back, and I'll be praying with you. It's as easy as that and as awesome as that. And, and if it's not you, maybe wouldn't you love your kids to tell you that, your grandkids to tell you that? But they look to us as parents and grandparents. Are we modeling it? Is it real in our life? And we can take that step of faith as well and then model it for them so that they come back and say, guess what? Guess what happened? It was my I will, Dad. That's my prayer for you. And we'll stand back in the goodness, in the all of the Lord and his goodness. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, we stand in all of you because of your goodness. 
God, you do love us despite our unfaithfulness. And so we ask you this week, move in our lives again that we might experience your grace, your, your love uh, in, in unconditional ways that then moves us closer to you out of our unfaithfulness, out of our wayward ways, back in relationship with you, back home with you. And, and not just us, God, but we're praying for our kids and our grandkids. God, we want, we want them too to know your love and your grace, and, and we want to model that for them. And so, God, we want to bless the people around us, whether they're family or friends or neighbors or complete strangers, if, if, so, if you lead us to, Lord. And so we pray, God, move us in this passage. This is an awesome passage about your grace and love. May it move us and inspire us this week to live out of not judgment, but to live out of your amazing, incredible, undeniable grace and love for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being here with us today to worship. Uh, if on the way out, if you have a, a part of your offering, a, a check or money that you're giving as part of your gift and donation today uh, to, to, to the church and to the ministry of the church, don't forget the black box uh, is in the back for that. Um, and you can also give online um, or you can mail it in uh, to the church uh, with the old snail mail way. Uh, on your way out, we're going to close those doors to the left. If uh, one of our ushers would do that uh, to my left, we're going to go out to the right uh, and make sure that we can uh, go out and then go outside to the right. I know it's raining. Hopefully you brought a jacket and an umbrella, and then you can exit out to the right, out the front doors, and go back to your cars. Thank you for being here. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.